So welcome to tonight's EdChat Interactive with Jim Knight. We're, we're really thrilled to have Jim here. Uh, I do want to first announce that uh, we're going to continue the Corwin Monday afternoon webinars on February 22nd. Uh, next Monday, we're having John Hattie, uh, March 14th, uh, Yang Zhao, and the 8th, Jennifer Abrams, and it will be continuing after that. If you go to www.edchatinteractive.org, uh, you can find all of our webinars that, that are coming up under coming events. Actually, most of you probably don't need an, an introduction to Jim, but um, but I'm, I'm going to do it anyhow. Uh, he's probably the preeminent authority on instructional coaching. Uh, he wrote one of the first articles on the topic, and he wrote the uh, what we call the instructional bible of coaching called Instructional Coaching, a Partnership Approach for Improving Instruction which was published by Corwin in 2007. Uh, he's been a, a or he is a research associate at the University of Kansas Center for Research on Learning and the president of the Instructional Coaching Group. Uh, Jim has spent more than two decades in instructional coaching and has written more than a half dozen professional, uh, professional learning books. Uh, and his most recent one in October of 2015 is Better Conversations and the Reflection Guide to Better Conversations, which is really the topic of, of this webinar. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring Jim up on stage. Jim, hi. Hey. So, uh, so where are you? I am in beautiful Lawrence, Kansas, the home of the Jayhawks. Number two in the nation, Jayhawks. And um, but uh, but but and you're going to be taking off this evening. You're going to Des Moines. I I, I understand, right? Yeah, I'm driving up to Des Moines. Well, right when we're done, I'm going to hit the road and head up there. It was actually supposed to be in Des Moines, but um, because of the weather in Chicago, we didn't. We changed our plan, so we're doing a. a I'm taking a different route. Okay. So uh, so well, welcome to Ed, Ed Chat Interactive, and welcome to the Core One series. Um, I think what I'll probably do is I'll pull myself down and get your slides up, and then you can start, and then I'll pop back in at different times. Meantime, as people have... Sounds great. The more questions, the better, I think. So I'm uh, going to try to do a quick overview of the book, which is pretty much impossible. We do about two days and then even struggle to cover all the material. But I'm going to do my best to give you kind of a quick overview of what's there. So if you want to look at some of the materials that are related to it, and uh, maybe you want to look at the book, we can go there. Um, uh, the book, as the next slide will show you, is about six beliefs and habits. And I want to sort of talk about those beliefs, talk about those habits, give you sort of a quick overview, and then zone in on one belief and, and one habit. But the first question I'd, I'd probably want to go to is, why would we even worry about that, which is what's on the next slide. Um, why would, we, why would we worry about communication? And I wrote this book. It's really started with instructional coaching because in instructional coaching, there was a chapter on communication. Then in Unmistakable Impact, there was a chapter on communication. And I kept coming back to the sort of the primacy, the real importance of communication. And um, I've just come to believe that uh, our schools are only going to be good as the conversations in the schools and that if we were to direct our attention to conversations, it could, it could really make a big difference. Um, but I, I've come to believe in doing this work that actually this is about the most important thing I think you can do is to work on your, on your conversations. I would say that right now, as the next slide shows you, that we're, we're living through a time of a communication crisis. Um, we've never had more ways to connect. My son, who lives in Tanzania, I can text him on WhatsApp. It's free. I can talk to him anytime. He can send me pictures. He can send me video clips. Doesn't cost anything. We've got Facebook and uh, all these things. I don't know, Instagram and uh, Pinterest and uh, enormous different ways of connection technologically. And yet, I would argue we've never had more ways to connect. We've never been more uh, separated from each other. Um, the crisis we're living in is that we we struggle to communicate. And I think it's critical that we work on communication, not just in in our lives, where I think it is fundamentally important, but also in schools. So, to me. As the next slide shows, communication is, is central to school improvement. Um, one of the people I've worked with 
is Michael Fullan. Um, he's probably the world's leading expert in educational change. I think he's written about 40 books on educational change. I just found out that he's presenting at our teaching, learning, and coaching conference next year, and I'm thrilled about it because he's been such a huge influence on my on my work. But Michael worked around the world, the United Kingdom. He had a big impact. He's having a big impact in California now. He had a big change effort in Ontario, Australia. Um, I don't know how many articles he's written, but 40 books is pretty impressive. And he said this um, about change, as you can see in the next slide. He said that when it comes to change, the single factor common to every successful change initiative is that relationships improve. If relationships improve, things get better. If they remain the same or get worse, ground is lost. So leaders have to be constant relationship builders with diverse people and groups, especially with people different than themselves. In other words, that old T-shirt you see in the in the in the in the department store or in the in the airport that says uh, floggings will continue until morale improves. It just doesn't work. If the if the relationships aren't getting better, learning isn't improving. And so, the way we communicate is is absolutely central to what happens in schools. For example, let's say PLCs. If our PLCs aren't aren't functioning well, if there isn't meaningful, respectful conversation going on. If there isn't a sharing of learning, what's the point of the PLC? Um, it troubles me that in many schools I go to, I'll hear people say, oh, I never go to the staff lounge. I can't take the conversations in there. That's the place where you'd want to find support and encouragement and share ideas and meet with friends and just have fun. And yet it's a place a lot of people will avoid because of the kind of conversations that take place there. So to me, the first thing I'd say is, if we want better schools, we have to have better conversations. But I also believe, really profoundly, as the next slide says, that effective conversations are critical for our personally fulfilling lives. If we want to have a, a rich and meaningful life, uh, our conversations are critical. In fact, if you think of the things that we um, get the most joy from and the experiences that bring us the most pain, most of the time it involves some kind of relationship and most of the time it can have a lot to do with the kind of communication that takes place. I don't know of something that would be easier to improve that could have a bigger impact on your life. Uh, Desmond Chidu, uh, talking about this and it's on the next slide, he says that we uh, are experiencing a radical brokenness in all of existence. He says times are out of joint. Alienation, disharmony, conflict and turmoil, enmity and hatred characterize so much of life. You don't have to go too far to see examples of that alienation and disharmony, conflict and turmoil, enmity and hatred characterizing our lives. Just turn on your TV, whether you watch uh, a political broadcast or you watch a sports program or you listen to talk radio or whatever you do, you're going to hear, or just read the comments on Facebook or on YouTube. There is an enormous amount of disharmony, conflict and turmoil. And, and I think um, it's almost heartbreaking. And so I believe fundamentally that if we can improve our conversations we'll become better in our schools but we'll also be we'll also have better lives uh, we'll be more effective as educational leaders or teachers but more important probably we'll better connect with the people in our community in our, in our workplace and in, in our homes there was a study done by the aarp and on the next slide it gives the data they they surveyed people over 40 to find out or over 45 to find out how many of them uh, had chronic loneliness, like they were really alone? And they found that one out of three adults were uh, chronically uh, um, alone. And not only were, uh, what was interesting was the group that was the most alone, and I think the number was 43%, it might have been, it's, it's over 40%, was the people 45 to 50. The age range, you might have thought well, people older in life were more alone, but actually the people almost prime of their life in their 40s. Um, were the pro most likely report that they were chronically alone. Almost half the people reported a profound sense of loneliness when they did this survey. So communication is critical. We're living in a time of crisis. Um, it's the most important thing you can do, I think, to improve your life, to improve the quality of your work. And so I wrote this book to kind of give people a playbook for how to how to deal with that. Jim, you know, you were you you were talking earlier. You were talking about people who are avoiding going into the teachers' lounges. Uh, what a common complaint here a lot is, uh, why should I go into the teacher's lounge? They're just they're just complaining on how to, you know, what do you do in that case? Can you turn around conversations like that? Yeah, one of the habits in better conversations is about how to redirect toxic conversations. And 
I think the first part of that is you have to be aware of what conversations you don't want to take part in. Um, if you see hear something that's gossipy or uh, uh, stereotypical or worse, you know, rex sexist or, or racist, you probably won't hear that, homophobic. But if you hear uh, a negative conversation, something that's not good for the school or not good for the, the students or teachers in the school, the first thing you have to be clear on is what kind of conversations are you not going to take part in. And then you need to develop some kind of strategy. And the strategy we talk about is where you come up with things like you might interrupt the conversation, you might name what's going on, you might um, just redirect the conversation when it, ha when it happens. And there's a whole forum, and you actually can download them online on the conversations, Better Conversations website, where you can sort of plan out what kind of conversations am I not going to participate in. Because when it happens, it happens so quick. If you're not prepared for it, you can kind of get um, overwhelmed and right. find yourself involved in something you don't want to do. It's not unlike classroom management, where you say, if I see these behaviors, this is how I'm going to correct it. You've got it, you've got it ready ahead of time. The concept's called responsive turns. It's about turning a conversation back. So, and then uh, there's a good question. I'm going to actually publish it from Sarah uh, so that everybody can see it. Um, uh, she's asking, is loneliness the same as being alone? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I like to, I think you can be alone and not be lonely. I think, uh, I don't uh, honestly know the items on the survey about critical loneliness, but I would say um, if you don't like your state where you are, you're probably lonely. That's my quick response. I mean, I, if I go out for a walk or actually the idea of spending a day or two by myself just in solitude, theoretically sounds pretty appealing. Um, but if I got there and I didn't want to be in that state, but I had no way out of it, then I think I'd call myself lonely. That's my, my quick thinking about that. But I think if you went back to that study, if you just look up loneliness among other adults, AARP, September 2010, uh, it would give you the, their definition of what they mean by loneliness. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to pull myself back down and I'll get your slides back up. Great. So as the slides come up, um, what I'd say is that even though this is a time of, uh, I think, brokenness to some extent, of course, everybody's in a different state, different situations. You might say, I don't feel that way at all. I feel like my life is wonderfully connected. But um, but some people don't feel that way. And what we did is we had people around the world um, complete um, these reflection forms and video record conversations and practice their skills. If I asked you, what do you have to do to get really good at uh, playing basketball? Or what do you have to do to get really good at playing some other kind of athletic sport, let's say tennis? You'd probably say what you need to do is you need to really practice. You need to focus on it. You, get, you have to give it careful attention. It's not going to happen quickly. You have to give some work to it. If you want to get good at something, it has to take. And you want to become a good singer. Uh, you're going to have to practice and work with other people. You want to get good at the piano. And, and yet we think we can just sort of snap our fingers and communicate. And I think we need to give the same kind of attention to the way we communicate that we give to, um, that we give to um, something else we want to get good at. Except in this case, communication stands at the heart of who we are. It stands at the heart of our lives. And if we can get better at it, it's going to make a big, big difference. So we should probably give at least as much time to this as we might give to a hobby. I should probably give as much time to communication as I do to my fantasy hockey team. Um, we had people around the world doing this study, and they filled in reflection forms. They looked at uh, what they were doing. They video recorded their conversation. I read over a thousand different forms, and what I would say is two things that give me hope. One of them is um, that people got better. Uh, people really improved their communication skills just by doing these simple things. And the second thing is that um, it wasn't that hard to do. They were able to pick an area, zone in on it, focus on it, and really quickly uh, see big improvements. One of our participants in the study said, um, Ben Collins, he's an assistant principal outside of Chicago, he said as he did the you know, on, uh, emotional connection, he said, I think I'm starting to see a better version of myself. Uh, and that's the idea, to see a better version of yourself by working on things. Um, one of the big ideas I encountered as I was doing research for this book and reading other books on communication was a quote, quote by John Gottman. It happens to be the next quote. And uh, Gottman's probably the world's leading expert on relationships. He's certainly one of the top people. And Gottman said this. 
he said that complex, fulfilling relationships don't suddenly appear in our lives fully formed. He said rather they develop one encounter at a time. And you might say, well, Jim, that's a no-brainer. This is on the next slide. Um, he said, obviously, that uh, relationships build or don't build. But um, what Gottman um, taught me, though, is that every conversation is a living thing. And so every conversation has the potential to get better. Every conversation has the potential to get worse. But it's not a static thing. So no matter how dark the situation might be, there's cause for hope. The flip side, though, is no matter how great things are, we can't be, we can't be careless in, in our relationships or we might, we might end up suffering. You know, we have to realize we are, it's like planting a garden. We have to nourish it. We have to pull the weeds. We have to fertilize to make the thing go. So in the book, um, I, I talk about these habits and beliefs. And I was in a, uh, uh, a session in, um, uh, a couple of years ago, actually, in Europe. And there was this really uh, wonderful English teacher. And he was really thinking hard. And he said, Jim, I, I listened to you talk about these beliefs and habits. But he said, um, he said, my fear is, and this is on the next slide, if I try to change how I communicate, won't I look like a fake? And he said, I really believe in being authentic. And if I don't, if I, if I don't, uh, if I try to do all this stuff, I'm afraid I'm going to look like, like, if I start to just make eye contact and listen carefully, all my friends are going to say, like, who are you and what are you trying to do? So I started to think about that and try to figure out, well, what does it mean to be authentic? And I went online and I looked up on the Oxford Dictionary, uh, Oxford English Dictionary, authenticity. And it said that when you're authentic, you're a true version of whatever you're supposed to be. They said, for example, like a Picasso, an authentic Picasso was painted by Picasso. And then I looked up Kierkegaard uh, and on the Encyclopedia of Philosophy, who's a literal leader in uh, existentialism, and who talked a lot about authenticity. And he said, as a Christian, he said, from my perspective, what it means to be authentic is to be the person God wants you to be. And so to try to be authentic is you try to suss out what it is God wants you to be and then try to be like that. And then Nietzsche, who's another existentialist, I guess, certainly influential philosopher talking about authenticity. He said, um, coming at it from the atheistic perspective, he said that to be authentic is to be who you are regardless of what society wants you to be. Uh, don't let society shape you. Be your true version of yourself. But whether, whatever your perspective might be, what, what became clear is, is to be authentic is to be who you say you are and who you think you are. And so the better conversation idea is that you would first off get clear on your beliefs. What is it I believe about my conversations? And then you analyze the way you act, your habits of practice to say, is what I do consistent with what I believe? Because if you believe one thing and act a different way, you're not being authentic at all. And what we found is when people watch a video of themselves communicating, and I'm one of those people, they go, holy smokes, I had no idea it looks like that. So uh, the first part of the better conversation approach is to look at what your beliefs are. So um, I've got a question here for Hal Portner. He says, in a conversation, there's a sender and a receiver. What can you give? What advice can you give in order to enhance the conversation? Really, it's good to hear, see you there, Hal. I would say um, I don't really hold to that model of communication. It's, uh, I, I think in communication that it's uh, a mutually constructed thing. And so there isn't a sender and receiver. There's two people communicating. But to me, when you adopt the traditional model of communication, that is, my job as a communicator is to get my message through, um, you, to some extent, don't fully appreciate the other person. And what I'm striving for in a better conversation is where both brains are actively involved in the, in, in the conversation. And so we have habits to get there, and we have six beliefs to get there, but they're all about constructing a situation where we can go back and forth. Um, I talk about um, top-down conversations versus partnership conversations. And there are times when you have to have a top-down conversation. When um, somebody get, is about to get hit by a truck, you don't ask them, how do you feel about the truck? You, you <laughs> get out of the way. You have a top-down conversation. But we default to top-down way too often, and a better conversation, I think, is, is often better. Um, so I've got six beliefs. And so if you skip ahead to the listing of the six beliefs, I'll, I'll talk about those beliefs. Um, so, um, first belief is I see others as equal partners in conversations. 
The second belief is I believe people should have a lot of autonomy. The third belief is I want to hear what other people have to say. The fourth belief is I don't judge my conversation partners. The fifth belief is conversation should be back and forth. And the sixth belief is that conversation should be life-giving. And I want to just focus on one of those beliefs, and that's the belief I want to hear what others have to say. Um, you'll have to spend some time thinking about these beliefs, and there's a reflection guide we created for this uh, book that uh, gives people a, a chance to dig into them and think carefully about them. Um, I'm not suggesting that people have to adopt these beliefs, but I think people have to know what they believe. So if they they don't um, if they don't um, embrace the belief, then what takes its place? If we don't believe that others are equals, then what what would take the place? So um, I want to just sort of uh, run through this first belief, and then we'll talk about some questions. The idea that I want to hear what the other person has to say stands at the heart of what I call a better conversation, because a better conversation is a conversation where all the voices in the room count. It's not me trying to get you to do what I want you to do. It's the two of us engaged in something like dialogue where we go back and forth. It's where all the voices are, are, are listened to. Um, there was a question that came up there just a bit ago. Do you think that um, in education we mostly default to top-down conversations? So I'd like to talk a little bit about the research on that. A while back, as the next slide shows, there was a, a book that's called First Break All the Rules. And in First Break All the Rules, they studied over people and they wanted to find out what are the characteristics of jobs that people love. And they found out one of the characteristics of a job that people love is um, that people want it, they, they feel like their voice is heard. So um, the actual statement was something like, at work I feel like my opinion matters. And so Shane Lopez, who's on the picture on the next slide, he, st he wanted to find out which jobs do people feel like their voice counts the most and which job do people feel like their voice counts the least. He sat down with me in Lawrence in a little restaurant to tell me about the results. He said, I looked at truck drivers and construction workers and I looked at uh, doctors and nurses, uh, workers in restaurants and teachers. And he said, uh, I looked at all these most common minors, most common types of careers, and I wanted to find out who felt their, their voice counted the most and who felt their voice counted the least. And he leaned in and he said to me, you wouldn't believe who's at the bottom of the list, lower than the person who's saving us here, serving us here in the restaurant, he said. He said the lowest on the list was teachers. The group of people who felt their voice counted the least were teachers. So we know that voice is critical, and yet often teachers don't feel their voice counts. And then um, Russ Qualia, who's in the next slide, um, has done a major survey of students to find out um, about what students' perspective on voice is. And he, I think it's around 70,000 students were polled, and he found that um, close to half the students he surveyed, this is in the next book called Student Voice, uh, close to half, half the students he surveyed said they didn't feel like their voice counted at all. They said, if I don't come to school, I don't think it'll really matter. And um, so Qualia um, reinforces what uh, Shane Lopez says, which is that student voice doesn't seem to matter any more than teacher voice does. And that makes sense. If teachers don't have a voice, then chances are students won't have a voice. So this first belief uh, 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 or, uh, about voice involves three elements. The first thing is uh, that I'm focused on the other person. Where's the focus of the conversation? This is on the next slide. Um, uh, if we do all of the talking, we're not engaged in a conversation that's a better conversation. A better conversation is one where both voices matter. The second, second element of the belief is being present in the conversation. Um, uh, we had, uh, uh, like I said, a thousand different people, a thousand different forms by a couple hundred people around the world. And what we found is um, maybe the number one finding was that our technology interferes with people's ability to have lively conversations. They say when the phone comes out, the conversation is over. And many people talked about when they watch video of their conversations, how, how they let their technology get in the way. I just had a, uh, a conference a couple weeks ago, and there's a person there. And he said, um, I learned about how much my technology is interviewing, interview, in, interrupting my connections with my daughter when I saw that every picture she drew of me, I had my, hand, my phone in my hand. And, um, and <laughs> every time I was looking at a picture of myself that my daughter drew, I had my phone in my hand. And so 
presence is we put away the devices, but also we've cleared our mind and we focused on the person. And I think one of the, most, it's one of the things I'm really trying to do is be more present in conversations. And then the last part about of the belief is just that we choose the right time to be present to people. If we're overwhelmed and stressed, it might not be the easiest time to be, to be present. So if we go back to the list of the six beliefs um, on page, it's uh, slide 29, um, I'll just touch on all of them briefly. The idea of equality is the idea that I feel like people's um, voices matter. And I feel like uh, they count the same as me. I'm not trying to get people to do what I want them to do. The idea about autonomy, uh, the fact is, the reality is people are going to do what they want to do, but I position other people as decision makers as much as I can. Um, when we insist, they will resist, is the old saying. And so that's the part of autonomy. Third thing is the belief we talked about. I want to hear what others have to say. Fourth one is I don't judge my conversation partners. I mean, judgment is a uh, learning killer. Michael Fullan talked about non-judgmentalism is one of the six secrets of change. But well, to learn, we have to be vulnerable. We have to take some risks. And if I feel judged, I'm not willing to take that, that risk. Uh, it's highly unlikely I can learn from somebody I feel judged. And trust it feels fun. It feels good to judge people for some other reason. The idea that conversation should be back and forth is that it's a dialogical conversation. It's a meeting of the minds. It's a conversation where meaning flows back and forth, not where I'm, and actually meaning is co-constructed, not where I'm trying to push one particular perspective. And then uh, when those five things are in place, your conversation should be life-giving, which is to say it's engaging and it encourages and fosters well-being and we feel, we feel better for the conversation. Um, I'd like to give folks a chance to respond with questions. So if you go to the next slide, there's a question there, and it's which of the better conversations beliefs do you agree or disagree with? It's a pretty quick overview, but it might give you a chance to do it. And I'm curious to see if folks have some questions they'd like to ask. So I'm open. Mitch, have you got something for me? Right. Yeah, well, so, so there, were, there were a couple of questions. I mean, one of the things as, um, you know, we're, we're educators, so we're, we're teaching people, and um, you know, one of our goals is to is to get people to improve. So, how do you have a conversation like, "Are you willing to improve without being insulting?" <laughs> well, when you have that kind of conversation, well, I think um, my belief is that um, we have to be careful about thinking we know what's right for the other person. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we engage in a conversation where they're the decision makers about their growth. But what we do, for example, a coach might use video, but instead of saying, you need to work on these three things and I'm going to tell you what to do, they'd say, what do you think about watching that video? We always look for some, some third thing that's external to the two of us. And then if it does come where the person says, well, tell me what you think, I would be tentative and say, well, I, I'm only one opinion. Here's what I think. But more importantly, what do you think? Because the issue is, what does that other person think anyway? So you, the, the thing is you, you have to engage in conversations that change the story we have about ourselves. But to do that, um, it doesn't do any good to, to be really blunt and direct if it's not heard. You have to speak the truth in a way it can be heard. So to do that, it's about externalizing the, the, the standard. And we look at video of a person. We, 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 we were provisional in the way we respond. I think you also have to see the good in the person and not be quick to see what's negative and be life affirming as opposed to judgmental. You can encourage growth without being judgmental, for sure. I think that's the only way that works. Where do principles fit in? Well, I think, uh, do you mean principles like the principle of the school or principles yeah. like your beliefs? Right. The, 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 the pal, <laughs> our pal, the principal. Right. Yeah. Well, I would say the principal is the first the first communicator in the school. And what the principal does and values is likely what's going to happen in the school. And so if a principal wants to shape the culture of the school, um, the first thing they need to do is to go deep on improving their communication skills. No matter how good they are at communicating, there's room for improvement. And so if my idea would be that schools spend intensive time, maybe once a month people reflect on their practices, their video recording conversations, and they look at it. And the first person to do that would be the principal. Then you can also establish um, beliefs that everybody helps construct, just the way DeFore talks about the way it's supposed to be in professional learning communities, certain principles that guide behavior. But you can't just say, uh, can we all agree these are the behaviors that, that we agree? 
there has to be something where people really have a voice in the process. It's co-constructed. People care about it. And um, so I think that's, that's all a part of it. The principal is the first leader, but the principal also shapes the culture. We were talking about you know, being, I think, authentic or living with integrity is the way I, I, I've heard it. What, what happens when you go out of integrity or, or you've lost trust or you're, or you're not authentic? How do you get back? Well, I think the first thing is teachers are more forgiving than we realize. Um, I think uh, teachers, not everybody, there's probably a tiny percent that are, but I think the vast majority of teachers um, are committed to growth and improvement and they recognize that other people are imperfect, but they can get better. So I think uh, in general, they're forgiving. But I, I think um, you have to... <laughs> It's like that old saying, when's the best time to plant the tree 20 years ago or today, you know, right. so you still, so I think, let's say you've been dishonest. I think you apologize. You do your best to make it clear. I'm not going to be dishonest again. I mean, let's, we take some extremely trust breaking things. The things that go into trust are, are things like competence. And so if you get really good at your job, people are more likely to, to, to trust you. Um, selflessness. And you should just be reflecting on your practice and say, is it all about me? Or do people know I have a benevolent stewardship approach to them? If people feel, if they can sense that I want what's best for them, they're going to be more likely to trust me. You can't also trust, generate trust and be dishonest. You have to be a, you have to be a person of some character, you know. But I think and there I are some things you can do. Yeah, go ahead. No, these questions weren't from me. And I should have, each time I asked a question, I should have given the credit to the person who asked the question. But I'm going to this time. I'm going to apologize to all the people. I did not meet. I did not deliberately steal your question. I was trying to to bring it up, and I, I too many too many things on my mind. But Anna Martine asked a question. Um, you know, I think as teachers, we often feel as though we are taught unvalued. And and I guess the question is, if we're feeling unvalued and we feel that we're being talked down, how do we get back in the conversation? That that would be my question. And I think that's what Anna Martin was asking. Yeah, well, um, first off, I trust you now that you've named it. You didn't call all those other people's names out, so we're, we're good on that. Um, <laughs> hmm. uh, that's a really, that's a really uh, tough question. Um, well, that's why one, I asked it of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm, the, first thing I'd, the first thing I'd say is... Easy, I would ask. Answer to myself. Right. The first thing I'd say is you have to get good at redirecting conversations. And so the section in Better Conversations about identifying what's non-negotiable, what you won't accept, and how to redirect it in a way that's um, respectful um, is important. I think, um, I think the things that generate trust become important. I think we have to, to some extent, uh, how we control our emotions, too, becomes important. Those are all habits we can work on. Um, but I, I do... I do believe that um, there's not much we can do about the other people. The person we can focus on is ourselves. And if we find ourselves in a dehumanizing environment and there's no hope, then, then um, we might want to ask ourselves, it's the best environment to be in. You know? mm -hmm. But we're still where we are and what do we do? And I think, I think controlling your emotions, redirecting conversations positively. I think also it's it's just really critical to get a clear sense of how we communicate. Most of us don't know what it looks like. When I watch myself on video and meetings, I just open up my computer, I turn on the camera, and then I record it and look at it. Mm -hmm. I'm blown away by what I see. And I think sometimes it's important to be really clear on what we do because um, we can't control the other person, but we can get better at what we do. So um, I think you could advocate um, that the school you're in would work hard at this. Do some kind of book study on maybe the partnership beliefs that stand behind the coaching book or look at better conversations or something. And you say, let's really look at the culture of this school. Because if the culture is toxic, the people who really feel it are the ones who are shorter than most of the teachers, the children in the school. Mm -hmm. Well, Tom Whitby was asking how much is the principal himself or herself shaped by the culture rather than shaping it? Oh, I think we're all uh, caught in that kind of situation, but I think um, we have to accept responsibility for where we are. You know, we have to do the best with, with the situation. None of us are in the perfect environment. There's something, there's some kind of 
mess up, screw up we have to deal with no matter where we are. And we just have to do our best. And then we have to acknowledge that we can't do better than our best. You know, we, we, and, and, and maybe we can't even do our best one day because we're too swamped, but we can, we can try, you know. And uh, whether the principle is shaped by the culture or the culture is shaped by the principle, and that's the same on the fifth grade team, and that's going to be the same um, in your community organizations, you know. It, but we can, we can't, what I saw in those thousand forums of people around the world is we can get, we can improve communication skills. It's a static thing. It just takes focus and feedback and practice. So, so you had the, um, the six conversation beliefs that, that were up there before, and I'm going to bring right. them up again. And I think you're getting ready for people to uh, interact with, with themselves and have a conversation with other people who are here, right? And um, so the question you would even, you may, I think you would even ask the question before I insinuated myself up here. Uh, so the question was, you know, which of the better conversations beliefs do you disagree or agree with and why? So right now to, um, you know, for us to uh, put those questions up, for us to come down and let people talk with themselves, or, do you, or would you prefer to uh, continue with the presentation? Well, I think we should probably, we've we got how much time left? 15 minutes? 15 minutes technically um, left. Yeah. <laughs> so why <laughs> but, don't we, what, you know, we yeah. yeah, I was going to say, we could always come back and, and do this yeah. another night to finish it, but. Right. Uh, why, don't we, why don't we move ahead to one more slide? And okay. people, people can have those conversations on the side if they want to, right? Right. Actually, so that's a great point because those, there's that IM window to type into their IM window to others in their group is, you know, of those six conversation beliefs, and I'll get them up in a, in a second, you know, which ones do you agree with and disagree with? And if you see somebody's response, maybe you can respond, you in the audience, you can respond to somebody else in your room and um, amplify or, or question some of the things that they said. In the meantime, I'm going to bring myself down and I'll bring the slides back up. Okay, I asked you to jump ahead to slide uh, number 44, Finding Common Ground. And um, I wanted, when I put this presentation together, I wanted to give you all a chance to download these slides, even if we didn't get a chance to talk about them. And uh, so I have this information if you want to get them. But um, there's uh, 10 habits, they're flashing by here as uh, a bitch goes ahead to the slide I want, but they're about demonstrating empathy, listening, fostering dialogue, asking better questions, making emotional connections with other people, um, being a witness to the good, which is uh, how we share positive information, finding common ground, redirecting toxic conversations, controlling toxic conversations, building trust. And there are simple strategies to follow, and there's a process where you video record your conversation and then you uh, analyze the conversation to see how you're doing, to see if your actions genuinely reflect what your beliefs are. If my belief is that other people's opinions should matter, and my reality is um, I'm not doing that, then I need to practice until I live in a way that's consistent. So this is a picture, and this is about one of the habits, uh, finding common ground. This is a picture of my son, Jeff. He's the guy with the yellowy t-shirt on, on, on my right-hand side. His wife, Jenny, is beside him there. And um, Jeff uh, and, and Jenny were, uh, boyfriend and girlfriend here at University of Kansas, but Jenny had always wanted to go to the Peace Corps. And so about 10 years ago, um, at the end when she graduated, after Jeff and her had had this great relationship, she said, well, Jeff, I've always wanted to go to the Peace Corps. I have to go to the Peace Corps. And so she was uh, sent to Tanzania. And then Jeff was um, pretty heartbroken to see her leave, but he understood completely. But then he started to say, I think, uh, I think maybe I'm going to go to Tanzania too. And uh, I thought, well, this is going to be amazing if Jeff can put this together. But sure enough, he, he got a job in an international school about an hour and a half from where Jenny lived in central Tanzania. He saved up the money for his flight. He flew over and um, a year and a half later in gate, uh, proposed to her. They were married in a little island in the Indian Ocean. They're still in Tanzania now, about seven years. Uh, they've been there together for about seven years. I go over a couple times. I've been there three times to see them. One time I went over to see Jeff, and they really do amazing work. Um, uh, they probably save a life a week. And in fact, uh, the materials that we sell, like the workbooks and the book Focus on Teaching, excuse me, not Focus on Teaching, High Impact Instruction, a portion of the profits all go to support their work, and we've been able to send them quite a bit to keep the work going. But anyway, one time I, I went over to see Jeff, and we spent a few weeks. I was observing a lot of the schools in, in Tanzania. And, 
he drove me back to Dar es Salaam, which is the main um, uh, the main city in Tanzania, where I had to fly back to Kansas. And uh, we're driving through this little village, and this police officer walks out, and he flags Jeff's car down, and he was kind of macho and kind of a big guy. And he said to Jeff, I'm going to find you 400,000 shillings. You were going 70 kilometers and 50 kilometers. Up. And um, 400,000 shillings is about $150. And then Jeff said, well, gee, I'm sorry. I didn't see that the sign had changed. The signs are really tiny. And the officer said, you didn't see the signs change. He says, well, I'm going to find you 400,000 shillings more because you didn't watch for the signs. And so Jeff starts to think about all of the money it's going to cost him because he's basically a volunteer. And I started to think about all the movies I've seen about prison in the developing world. Um, anyway, then Jeff got out of the car, and I, or the truck, and I was sitting there. And then I'm watching him, and the officer starts to laugh a little bit and relaxes and I thought well this looks pretty safe and I come out and the officer puts his arm around Jeff and he says this is my friend my very good friend and I get back in the car and we drive off and I said Jeff what happened back there with that police officer well Jeff has a real knack for languages and he he just picks them up like that it's, it's a gift and um, he um, he was committed to learning uh, key Swahili he learned it in about I don't know six months or so, he's pretty fluent. Now he's perfectly bilingual. And once he learned Ki Swahili, he said, I want to learn all the tribal languages from different people uh, in different parts of the country. And there are a lot of different tribal languages. But he said, my goal is that I can speak to anybody in their, their native tongue when I meet them. And so he knew where we were driving. We we're in this village, not too far from a big city called Oringa, about 70,000 people. And he figured this guy must be in this tribe. And so he turned to the officer and he spoke to him in his tribal language. And the officer looked at Jeff and he said, no American has ever talked to me in my language before. And Jeff was quick not to tell him that he was actually Canadian. But, um, uh, and then they started to relax and uh, they started to talk. And then the officer said, well, I can't find you 800,000 shillings one day. And Jeff said, how about 1,000 shillings, 50 cents? And he says, I don't have a ticket for 50 cents. And Jeff said, well, Hobby, I, I, I know I did wrong and I don't do it again. And the officer said, that's fine, that's great. And then the officer gave him his number and he says, well, look, if you're ever back in Oringa, just give me a call, maybe we can hang out or something. And, um, and sure enough, uh, Jeff and Jenny, that's his wife right there, were in Oringa and they were in a little internet cafe and somebody stole Jenny's computer and they called the police officer and he got her computer back all because they found common ground. And that's one of the habits. One of the habits is to find ways to find community with other people, to find what we hold in common with other people. Um, I like Maya Angelou's quote, which is on the next slide that sums this up. She says, um, I note the obvious differences between each sort and type, but we are more alike, my friends, and we are unalike. And um, if we're going to heal the radical brokenness that, that uh, Desmond Tutu talks about, I think one way we can do that is by not obsessing about our differences, but to look for ways to connect. So I came up with this cutesy little um, acronym, I CARE, and the idea is uh, these are things to think about as ways to connect and things to be careful about because they could divide us. So now whenever I go into a classroom to work with a teacher or I meet somebody randomly, if I remember, I think about these kinds of things and I look for things that I hold in common. I might think about, for example, interests. There's a guy, Joe Buckley, he's a friend of mine in Maryland. He's a big University of Kentucky basketball fan. I'm Kansas and whenever we get together our first five or ten minutes we just talk about basketball we just catch up but our interest could be things like music or what books we're reading and all those different kinds of things so what are we interested in it could be cooking it could be travel it could be any number of different things the second thing is what are our beliefs what are our convictions most educators would say I have a deep commitment to social justice what I want is I want my students to transcend their risk I want them to be as successful as possible I want them to transcend any kind of barriers. I want them to be able to read and be active learners. I want them to love, love learning and love reading. So educators might get together and they might establish a certain kind of connection around their beliefs. And there are other kinds of beliefs too, people's perspectives on, um, on what their point, purpose is in life and uh, beliefs about, for example, social justice. Once you realize you share these beliefs, you're, you're in good shape. The trouble is the beliefs also divide us. And so we have to be careful about how we talk about these convictions or beliefs. I should say um, I use convictions because I care seems like a better acronym than I bear, which is what it would be with beliefs. But convictions are kind of synonymous with, uh, with beliefs. 
And then activities. It's often the case that when we run our workshops in Kansas or in other places, that people recognize they share certain kinds of things. Maybe they're both runners and they like to go to run it uh, to go running and they talk about what kind of shoes they wear and different kinds of things. And then what do you do? Your roles and responsibilities. Um, if you can find two people who have the same role and responsibility, they immediately establish some kind of connection. If you're away and you need another instructional coach and your job is an instructional coach or you're a element of roles and responsibilities that establishes a connection. And then finally, experiences you've had. Maybe you've traveled somewhere, you've done some kind of experience, you run a marathon, you've, uh, uh, you've gone to Yosemite. Um, once you find somebody and they share those things, you, you make a connection. So you go to the next page, there's a slide there that shows you the kind of thing we do in this whole process. Is we have all these forms, which you can download at uh, the Corwin website for better conversations. And um, uh, this is one for looking at finding common ground. And with a partner, you use the form to uh, explore finding common ground. It's just a way to kind of prepare it. And all these forms are forms for looking back and saying, how did it go? And often we video record a conversation to see how it works. That might not work so much with finding common ground, but it's really good for things like uh, dialogue or, or listening. And then we can look at or we can look ahead. We can say, how can I prepare myself to find common ground as I, as I move forward? So that's an example of a habit. There are 10 other habits, and there are six beliefs. And I just want to revisit uh, that, uh, the skip to the, 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 the 10 habits and, and talk about them real briefly, and then see what questions we've got left. We talked about the uh, habit of finding common ground, but probably the most important habit is the idea of demonstrating empathy. Um, empathy is about understanding the emotions and understanding the way the person thinks, and in particular, what their needs are cognitive and, and uh, affective uh, empathy. It's also about understanding yourself, being empathetic towards yourself, so you can, you can make sure your own mental models don't get in the way. And listening is really just about making sure you're focused on the other person, um, making sure that um, they get a chance to talk and the focus of the conversation is on them, um, pausing before you respond sometimes. And if those are things that are too difficult, it's just not interrupting. Dialogue is about balancing advocacy with inquiry. So sharing what I think, because the dialogue isn't about me silencing myself, but sharing it in a way that allows for the other person to share their opinion, not talking in a way to shut them down, but actually to open things up. Asking questions that lead to better conversations usually are open questions that prompt people to talk about their opinions. But at the heart of it, a good question is one where I truly want to hear what the other person has to say. It's not a manipulative question. It's one that's grounded in genuine curiosity. Now, John Goplin, I mentioned before, he says that emotional connection uh, stands at the heart of relationships. It's uh, emotional connections that make all the difference. And he provides us with vocabulary for that emotional connection. And uh, he talks about becoming aware of what we do that blocks emotional connection and, and so forth. That's what uh, Ben Collins was working on when he said, I'm starting to see a better version of myself. On the next slide, you'll see uh, being a witness to the good as one of the slides, and that's just about learning how to share information that the other person can, can actually hear what's positive. Um, part of that is simply um, providing positive information in a way that's non-judgmental. I mean, sure, I like it if somebody says, you're really great at what you do, you're really a kind person, but that's still kind of judgmental. I'd rather that they, they see something and share it. And often the way we share positive information gets in the way. I talked about finding common ground. I talked about redirecting toxic conversations and controlling our emotions is about recognizing that there's a gap between stimulus and response and making sure that gap exists, taking time before we respond emotionally. And the last thing, building trust. There's a, a few simple things that go into that. Uh, I talked about some of them, the idea of competence, uh, the idea of warmth, uh, the idea of being uh, reliable, uh, and then a person of character. And um, none of these things are going to happen quickly, but if you dedicate yourself to one of these things, and over a year you focus on this, just like Ben Collins, you'll probably start to feel like you're seeing a better version of yourself. Okay, Mitch, my little clock says we're almost at the end. I'm wondering if you have some questions for me you'd like to share. So there were some great questions. Uh, so uh, there's a question from Courtney Thompson, and she was talking about that, 
well, and I'm going to paraphrase, uh, but she was saying, you know, it's it's maybe you can fall into a trap of the teacher and say, let me show you how how I teach this and kind of modeling the lessons. How do you get more into a conversation with teachers to get more real, true coach, real coaching and real change? Well, I think um, for real co coaching and real change, one of the things that's critical is that your communication skills, the way you listen, the way you build common ground. But um, like any kind of change initiative, you need a structure for the process too. So coaching involves when we describe it a, a phase for identification then improve or excuse me identification learn and then improve. and there's real set questions we follow through we move, it's almost like a dance you move through the whole thing till you get there and but you need a tight process and our phrase is freedom within form the, it's an adaptive process there's it, it, it can it's going to be different every time but if you don't have a set of questions to work from if you don't have a process it's going to be pretty inefficient and and yet the questions, we, the way we do it, we always end at a goal. We always have a, have a clear sense of, of where I've never, I've never ever gone through the coaching process since we designed it this way and had it not lead to a, a goal. And that, that process is in an article I did for journal and staff development, and it's called uh, The Coaching Cycle. So it's about February 2015 um, is when that article came out. Well, and does modeling then play a role in it also? It, 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 well, start. modeling it. Modeling plays a role once you have a goal and once you have a teaching strategy the person wants. But modeling can happen in lots of ways. It could be we watch a video. It could be we watch another teacher. It could be I come in your classroom. People are learning a teaching strategy. They need, they need to, to see it. Now, some forms of coaching don't involve instructional practices. Cognitive coaching could involve that. But when you use it in cognitive coaching, you'd probably move into what they would call the consulting mode. But instructional coaching is about you're using teaching strategies to change what's happening in the class. And so in instructional coaching modeling becomes a part of it modeling in the sense that they get to see the practice that they're learning if it's in terms of commu communication like modeling communication skills um, you can do that on teams where different people are, sh are coming together and sharing video of their conversations but and I, I'm not trying to push all these right. books but in focus on teaching there's a there's a whole thing on how to set up a video study group with that's psychologically safe. If it's not psychologically safe, nobody's going to say, let me show you what a terrible communicator I am. You're going to have to be in a set setting where people feel safe. So there's been a lot of great questions. I'd like one more question, which is kind of from a different angle. And that is that a lot of uh, what, what we've been talking about this evening has been, you know, co having a conversation with another person. But at, at what how is that, what are the differences and similarities between, you know, one-to-one -one conversation and a group conversation? Or, or what are some strategies to facilitate effective group conversations? I think you'd have to go through each habit and think about them pretty carefully. Um, I would think uh, off the top of my head that most of the habits uh, are really, really important. For example, if we're talking about a teacher with students, if that teacher has real empathy for the kids and understands where they're coming from, it's going to help them uh, reach the kids. If they listen carefully to students, if they're reliable and they're credible, um, it's going to make a big difference. If they're non-judgmental, you know, so I think the beliefs and habits um, apply in groups as well as they apply one-to-one, -one. but I can tell you um, that it's harder for people to see you communicating authentically in a group than it is one-to-one. -one. Because when you talk to people in a group, you get the cultural norm. But when you talk to them one to one, you get the real person. And so we really believe in, in finding some way to work one to one. Probably it applies in the classroom just as much as it applies in coaching. But the best way to get coaching started is, is, is I think, is a one to one conversation to just explain what it's all about and let people know. Um, even if people don't embrace it, at least they see you as a real person and they, they get a better idea. But I, I, I do think. Um, they all kind of apply in a group setting, um, but you know, sort of have to tackle them one by one. And I, I find, you know, personally, when I'm involved in a group, is that to the extent that I'm helping lead the group, or, or if I am leading the group, group, to make sure that everybody's voice gets heard, one person, or especially me, but but another person who's dominating, and um, 
and if I notice that a person has been quiet, to encourage that person to participate and 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 have their opinion heard as well. Um, I, I found that has sometimes worked in, in groups. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, you know, it's the autonomy thing. Um, but you, the really good thing about what you're saying is the, the principle of I want to hear what the other person has to say. When we're in a group, we have to make sure that, that one voice isn't selling somebody else's voice in the group. And if one person's doing all the talking, then the other voices aren't being heard. So group work is, uh, it, it changes the dynamics of what we do for sure. I like structure. came from Christina. Right. I like I like structure I like structures that like the simplest one is the idea of the talking stick you know whoever holds a talking stick gets to speak I think that idea of freedom within form um, is critical but other things like the affinity diagram brainstorming different kinds of structured activities nominal group technique where where the process gives everybody a, an opportunity to do it without feeling they're they're being told they have to do it. Okay, um, so we are uh, past a question from Sandra. That it, um, there's, there's a question around if you're an evaluator, that kind of gives you a particular role. So, um, so the question is: is if you're an evaluator, how can you can you provide effective instructional coaching, um, and can you get somebody's trust if you're also responsible for evaluating them? Well, the trouble with evaluation is people perceive you differently. Um, and uh, I know in my case, uh, when I was uh, full time at the University of Kansas, my boss was the nicest person possible. But, you know, if I knew he was going to hear something, I would want him to hear a good version of it. You know, I wasn't, I was pretty candid with him sometimes, but, but it was, I'm aware of the fact that he was the person who evaluated me. But I think you do what you can. With what you've got, you try to make it work, and you do what you can. And sometimes, it work. I think when it's an unequal, structured relationship, it's all the more important to listen and demonstrate empathy and ask good questions and engage in dialogue. I think it's way more, way more important. So I think that strategies are even more important in in an unequal situation, so to speak, than when you're already equal because you overcome so many barriers. Okay, um, I have a few more closing slides, uh, including, uh, I just want to mention to people, a few people have asked, uh, will they get a copy of the slides? And yes, uh, we'll be in contact with you and we'll have the slides available for download. Um, and they may actually even be emailed to you as well. Uh, do you want to close off with some, uh, a, you know, a summary and then, and, th and then I'll get the closing slides about uh, you and Corwin? Yeah, I just have to say really quickly that, um, Go back to what I started with, which is that I think this is about the most important thing you can spend your time on, thinking about how you communicate at school and how you communicate in your life. Because to be an effective teacher, to be an effective change leader, communication stands at the heart of it. And then to feel fulfilled, to feel happy, it's critical. And so to do that is going to take work, though. You have to, you have to think about it, analyze it, start to use. The forms are all online. You can just download them. They're free. Start to analyze yeah. your communication. Show skills. the website. I'm going to show the website in a few minutes too. So. Great. So I would say um, if you look at the book by Patterson and his colleagues called Influencer, it's a great summary on why people do or don't do change. And he says it comes down to two questions. Is it worth it and can I do it? And, um, and so I've tried to make a passionate claim that it's worth it, that it's really the most important thing. And so if you're still thinking, well, I don't know if I should do this, it must be that you're thinking, I don't think I can do it, but I've got a thousand forms here in this room right here of people who showed you can do it. You can get better, and it's really important. So I think if you're thinking I can't do it, you might want to step back and say, is it because I don't think it's worth it, or I don't think I can do it? Because if the answer is yes to those both those things, you should dive in. Even if it's hard? Well, you know, it's going to be hard sometimes. Um, some of the most best learning experiences are ones where I realized I wasn't the person I thought I was. Um, that's, that's a hard thing, but you know, the first time I watched myself on video in a meeting, I thought, man, I am such a jerk. Actually, I used a two-syllable word I can't use here, but at any rate, I, I couldn't believe it. And, uh, and then I thought, after I dealt with how I felt about it, I thought, that's what people see every day. That's the person they see, that guy on the film. And, and I said, well, I got I to gotta work on that. I still got a lot of room for improvement, but I hope I'm a little bit better than I was two years ago. Well, I think you're great. 
<laughs> okay. Well, um, thank you. And um, I think what I'll do is I'll pull you down and I'll pull um, the last few slides uh, from up and information on how to cite. So uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, hope to do this again with you at, at some point. And uh, have easy travels tomorrow to Des Moines. I'm going tonight, but thank you. Oh, have easy, easier travels tonight then. That's right. Okay. Right. Thanks, Mitch. And let me pull up the last slides here. And and uh, just re reiterate again that Corwin is going to be getting you the um, the the slides sometime in the next week, uh, providing we have your email address, which I believe we do. Um, here, let me let me expand this a little bit. Here's a list of the uh, different Jim Knight has has created, and you have a, a twenty percent discount. That will send you that discount code in the email also. Uh, but but there's a 20% discount code if you use the promo code E161D3 uh, when you purchase the books on the Corwin website. And then um, uh, you can um, attend a, a, a gym night instruction. Here are some of the, um, the topics. Um, and I guess he's... Uh, it's a, there's a conference that Jim's going to be at on November 3rd and 4th, and just early. Uh, there's an early bird price of $599. It ends March 31st, so you have uh, just about a month to to register for that. Um, so, um, oh, so here are here are the different dates. You can find these also on the Corwin website, and um, and then you can also invite Jim uh, to to speak at your site. So uh, here are some of the things that. That Jim has talked about in the past. So uh, I want to thank everybody for attending. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of your questions, and um, I'm also sorry uh, if uh, if I stole one of your questions. And, um, I got I, I'm sorry if I got caught up in the moment and just blurted them out. Um, but uh, you can also contact Jim. Uh, well, we'll put an archive up, but in the email we'll give you uh, the instructions on how to contact Jim. So, so if you have specific questions, you can ask him directly. So it's uh, it's it's about 12 minutes late. Um, so I want to thank you again for attending EdChat Interactive. Uh, please feel free to sign up for other events of ours at www.edchatinteractive.org. And I hope to see you at another event. We have we have an event on coming up Thursday night. So uh, talk to you all soon. And this is signing out. This is Mitch Weisberg for EdChat Interactive. Take care.